Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to this month's edition in our lecture series um, presented by the Master of Arts in Financial Integrity Program at Case Western Reserve University School of Law and co-sponsored by the Northern Ohio chapter of ACAMS. Um, tonight, um, the Master of Arts in Financial Integrity Program is bringing to you a program entitled AML Account Surveillance Using Bulk Data Analysis, Present and Future. Um, we're very uh, grateful to have with us for this presentation um, three speakers. Mark Twombly, who is the Senior Vice President for Financial Crimes Compliance, um, Director um, of the Financial Crimes Governance BSA AML at KeyBank. Bill Hauserman, who's a Senior Director of Financial Crime Compliance Practice at Moody Analytics. And Priyank Patel, who's the Senior Vice President, Financial Crimes Risk Surveillance Director um, for Financial Crimes govern uh, Governance at KeyBank. Um, at the, uh, at, during the uh, seminar, if you have questions, um, you'll see there's a question and answer um, place where you can submit a question. And um, those questions will be um, fielded by Jim Hixenbaugh. Um, and also I will be putting up at the end of the uh, webinar, the continuing legal education uh, code number. Um, you will also, um, if you're a member of ACAMS, be getting, um, you can get CE credit as well for this presentation. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Bill Cloninger from the ACAMS Northern Ohio chapter. Um, Bill, thanks for co-sponsoring this with us at the law school. And um, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Kathy Lesser Mansfield. I'm the director of the MAFI program. Uh, Bill, go ahead. Okay, uh, just a few housekeeping notes for tonight's session. Uh, all of you are muted from the presenters and from each other, so you can't talk over your microphone. Please use the Q&A function to ask questions. And um, I just, it just, hang on, let me go back. What's my last point here? The chat will be used primarily to give you information, mostly at the end of the program about how to uh, apply for your um, CE credits. Um, okay, just a, a plug for the ACAMS um, Las Vegas conference. It's September 27 to 29 in Las Vegas, and it's also being presented virtually. Um, of course, we have to um, give our thanks to our, the chapter sponsors, KeyBank, PNC, uh, AML Right Source, um, MGM Northfield uh, Park, Case Western Reserve, um, Financial Integrity Institute, and the MAFI program, and Notre Dame College's Center for Intelligence Studies. Without them, we couldn't be doing half of what we do. So thank, thank them very much. Okay, and as Kathy went, went over them, our speakers tonight are Mark Twombly, Priyank Patel, and Bill Hauserman. Mark, uh, let me stop sharing my screen and hand it over to you. Thank you, Bill. Can people see my screen? Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. That as uh, first off, that um, Priyanka and I would like to thank the Northern Ohio ACAMS and Case Western to invite us to speak. That uh, this is a topic that Priyanka and I deal with on a daily basis, so we're happy to speak about it. So we're going to just talk about what we're seeing in from terms of data analysis and transaction monitoring. Just want to give this caveat up front that. We're going to go over a case study here, but it is meant to be more of a high level illustration of how we go about the process of creating something. Um, but it's not an actual monitoring. We've got something similar, but it's not the actual thing we have in place. And then also we want to just be mindful that there would be multiple parties who'd be involved when we're going through this process who would help us design any type of monitoring 
you would have to go through a model validation process and then assistance to put it into production for any monitoring created. What Priyank and I are gonna talk about tonight or have up here on the agenda. So for, I'll handle the first three bullets. So, you know, I'm gonna first talk about what is a transaction monitoring coverage assessment. That's one of the things that we do, you know, right off the bat when we're going about trying to design something. And then after we've gone through that, we go, we ask the question, you know, what suspicious activity do we want to detect and monitor for that, you know, that you'll see as we go through this, there's a lot of companies out there that offer monitoring and you can buy off the shelf things, which is fine, but like some of them try to be everything to everyone and you end up with a lot of false positives. And I think we'll talk about that, but so we try to be a little bit more tailored. And then when we're going about it, we're gonna talk about, all right, once we've decided what we wanna monitor for, what would be the attributes of that suspicious activity? What would we wanna be looking for? And then I'm going to hand it off to Priyank. And from there, Priyank's going to talk about, all right, we've identified the attributes that we're interested in. How do we translate these attributes into data elements that we can maybe detect or monitor for? Um, and then he's going to talk about building out and testing a detection and monitoring scenario. And then he'll wrap up with what is a, a future of suspicious activity detection and monitoring. Um, we do have uh, should have time in between here. So if people have questions as we go along, feel free to ask questions. So on this first slide here, we're just talking about what is a transaction monitoring coverage assessment on a periodic basis that Priyank and I will work with our teams to just see what do we have in place for monitoring. The coverage assessment is essentially an inventory of what we have, and we'll be looking for what we already have in place and maybe where do we have a gap? So we'll be uh, looking for maybe a typology, an account type, um, a product, or a geography. So what we have here is this, this is a basic matrix to give you an idea of how we'd go about doing this. And we would do it actually for each of the items listed above. So, you know, in this example, we're just talking about products. So in this example, uh, we have on going down the side, we have various scenarios that we maybe have in place. And then across the top, we have the various products that we'd be monitoring for, you know, cash and cash equivalents, cards, ACH, wire, and other. There is a regulatory expectation that if you offer certain types of accounts, if you offer uh, certain customers, if you offer production, various transaction types or geographies, you're supposed to have monitoring in place. So this is a real basic matrix I've created, but let's say, for example, that your bank or financial institution is offering like Zelle or P2P. You'd want to have something up there across the top saying that, and then does your monitoring capture that? Um, one of the things that we always encourage people is really get to know what you have in place for your monitoring. That you'll, as I mentioned, that some places that they'll take what's off the shelf and just put it in production, which isn't always the best idea. And you might not know what you're actually covering for that. For example, that you maybe put in, we'll say this um, structuring avoiding reporting thresholds. You know, this is a pretty basic thing that you'd have for most monitorings. But if it only covers basic depository accounts, is that enough? For example, you know, does it also monitor your brokerage accounts? Does it monitor your trust accounts? If it's only monitoring your depository accounts, it's not picking up structuring in these other accounts if that's not part of the monitoring. So you wanna make sure that you are covering off on each of these items. So after we've completed the coverage assess assessment, the first question that we ask is, you know, what do we wanna detect and monitor for? Are we looking for a certain suspicious typology? Is it terrorism financing, for example? Or maybe we're looking for suspicious activity in account type. So, do we have any type of monitoring in place for a brokerage account? Um, then, you know, we get to customer type. Do we have monitoring in place for certain high risk customer types, such as an MSB? Do we, we probably want to have something in place to monitor for that? And then, uh, you know, we'll look at the product type. So do we have monitoring in place for something such as Fedwire? And then finally, do we have something for geography? So if we're in a high risk geography, you know, if you are involved with foreign wires, you probably have to have something in place with that. If you're servicing the southwest border, you probably need to have something in place for that. So that's what we're talking about when we say, what type of suspicious activity do we want to detect and monitor for? For the sake of this discussion, we're going to just walk you through a typology, human trafficking, that 
um, I'm sure many of you have probably encountered for if you, your own financial institutions. So we said we wanted to uh, monitor for and detect human trafficking. So the first thing we do is that, you know, we'll just sit down and spitball saying, all right, if we want to detect human trafficking, what might we see? So what we have listed here are some red flags that the, these red flags actually come from Pinson put out multiple advisories on this. And so that's where we got most of these from, but it doesn't have to be FinCEN, you know, there might be FATF, there can be uh, industry papers. This gives you an idea. You, you probably even know from your common sense of like what you might be looking for. So for human trafficking, just going through some of these bullets, cash in, cash out from different locations. So let's say we see a lot of money coming in, being deposited in Cleveland, but the withdrawals are all occurring in McAllen, Texas, or San Isidro in California. So that gives you an idea, all right, that doesn't really seem to make sense. Um, you know, are there a lot of, uh, you see a lot of ACH activity or prepaid cards? That's one of the things you probably might see in human trafficking. Um, low dollar transfers near Southwest border or multiple transfers at Southwest border. That, that's always a big red flag. Um, you know, the one at the bottom here, transactions conducted by individuals, but they're always escorted by a third party. So when you have people who are walking into the bank with another person and basically the person's watching them, that gives you an idea that there maybe is a human trafficking in play. Here are some more red flags. So, you know, if you see things that don't seem to be in line or excessive payments, for example, if we see excessive payments for housing, lodging, vehicle rentals, that type of thing. Um, is there a lot of tr uh, transactions with different geographic locations, um, foreign countries that are maybe known for human trafficking? Uh, we'll sometimes see a lot of transactions that are right below the 3,000 for like monetary instrument or right below the 10,000, which would be for structuring. Um, you know, frequent payments to online escort services, that type of thing. Um, payroll or the non-existence of payroll, those are things that we would always keep an eye out for. And then, uh, caching of payroll checks that were kept by the employer deposited back. Um, that's sort of paired with the item at the bottom there where they deduct large amounts. So if you see a payroll check and then there's a deduction for 90% of it to cover quote unquote housing, you see that a lot of times in, in human trafficking. And then for this final page here of the red flags, what we see is, you know, maybe uh, common signers or KYC information. They share common identifiers with an escort agency that I believe uh, Bill's even talked about this, but Bill Cloninger was heavily involved in a human trafficking task force that we worked with locally in Cleveland tied to the All-Star game a couple of years ago. And with that, we worked with a, a social media and internet surveillance company called Artemis that is involved with human trafficking or monitoring for human trafficking. And, and they were able to pull up ads from human trafficking or from adult services ads. We took those phone numbers and then we pinged them against our own customer database to um, see if we had someone involved there. And so the, that was pretty uh, successful. Uh, another one you have here, use of intensive cash intensive businesses that are known or suspected of uh, human trafficking. So it could be salons, spas, that type of thing. And then you, what we've really been seeing us increase in recently is the use of virtual currency to uh, buy online advertisements. So those are kind of to give you an idea of the red flags that we would maybe see or expect to see in human trafficking. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Priyank who's gonna talk about how we take these red flags and then we convert them over or look for data elements that we maybe would be able to see within uh, our transaction data. Priyank? Thanks, Mark. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, all right, so this slide basically shows um, some of the elements that um, we have kind of focused uh, while building the typology. All of these elements come from the initial red flag that Mark has kind of covered. Um, as you can see, there were roughly about 25 to 30 variables um, or red flags, and not all of them uh, could be possible from you know detection perspective, right? Some of them are 
you know, useful for investigation, things like, you know, picking different handwriting um, on the check images, right? It's a hard to build a, a typology around that, right? So the first thing we do, you know, we closely work it down and work with Mark's team and my team. We basically figure out which one are the things that we can really, you know, design from a detection query perspective, right? Um, and most of those are, you know, tied to your transaction data elements and obviously some of the KYC data elements. And as you can see, many of them are, you know, here on this slide. Uh, we primarily focus on cash deposit activity to look for um, the, the human trafficking enterprises, right? Low dollar deposit coming into the branch or ATM. Uh, we also, you know, focus on the cash withdrawal that basically look for, um, you know, enterprises doing the slavery, right? Um, so from that perspective, we focus on the businesses um, as well as individuals. Also, you know, off our ATM deposit, uh, as well as, uh, you know, expenses tied to the human trafficking. Again, and the intent is not to look at, you know, handful of transaction, right? We are looking for excessive and look for, you know, high risk MCC that are typically available in your credit card and debit card transaction. Um, so we basically figure out what MCCs we are interested in looking at it. You know, they are, you know, fast food, motels, a um, lot of, um, you know, airlines, bus lines or Uber. Um, or nail, nail saloon. So those are the MCC we kind of, you know, focus on leveraging it. So once we have this list of data elements, the next step is to start configuring the initial design. And Mark, if you go to the next slide, um, the kind of, you know, here, uh, the first step is to obviously start simple, uh, but we all know, right, that it's going to give us a lot of data because cash is common. Um, and as you can see here, uh, when we look at simply uh, a, a deposit between 500 to 3000 uh, dollars and uh, or or that, uh, and uh, aggregating more than 6000 dollars you can see the distribution of data here that shows by the count and the amount and if you just go as it is right as a scenario or a typology it is going to create over 5000 alert right and that is not the intent, the intent is to do a spear phishing, right? This is not the way of detecting your, you know, significant cash activity, right? What we are trying to detect here is a very specific targeted behavior, right? So this is where we do a lot of brainstorming to see what we are really identifying, um, you know, out of this, um, you know, initial distribution analysis and then figure out, okay, is there any way we can add some more criteria to, to reduce the initial population Right, that we are interested in. Um, so, Mark, if you can go to the next slide, um, you know, by by just adding a one more. Prank, can we just hold on for a second? That we did have a question yep. that came in. When you look okay. at transactions, is it just one-off transactions or patterns of behavior, or why would you possibly do both at different thresholds? So we are looking for pattern of behavior, right? So we are basically trying to look for, as we seen in the some of the red flag, you look for multiple deposit. Many times deposit comes into one location and withdrawals go into different location, right? So you are looking for a pattern of behavior, multiple transaction happening um, throughout the week, throughout the month, right? So as you can see, this particular initial typology we designed, we are looking for 30 days look back period and try to see, okay, if we have a, you know, eight or more count of, or eight count and in a different amount ranges, starting from $6,000 to all the way $50,000, how many customers or accounts really fall into that category? Um, so that this is basically give us the initial distribution. Uh, but again, this is not the final design, right? Because this is, you know, I, I don't see any enterprise would or bank would expect that they have, you know, this many customer involved in a human trafficking behavior. So Mark, can you go to the next slide? Yep, so here you can see by simply adding a one more criteria, um, you know, multiple of uh, transaction in the multiple of 10, right? So, you know, we are looking at cash and uh, we suspect that, you know, most of the deposits that we are going to see, right? They're not going to be in an odd or even, you know, dollar, right? They're going to be mostly in a round dollar transaction. And we started looking at just uh, the transaction in a multiple of $10 and you can see that the transaction or the customer volume drastically reduced from 5,000 to 500, right? So this is something uh, a reasonably 
manageable population, right? And the next step, what we do from here is basically take some of the samples from different buckets, right? You start probably high, right? You start at the transition count 10 or more uh, with a aggregated amount more than $10,000, right? In a 30 days period and try to, you know, get into the data to understand, okay, what kind of activity are you seeing? Is it really tied to the human trafficking behavior or it is something else, right? Here, the intent is not to detect non-human trafficking, right? Like your unknown source of fund, right? The intent is to really detect the human trafficking behavior, right? And that's what basically we take some of the sample, go into it and determine, are there any other additional criteria that we want to add here that ultimately help us to further refine this typology? So this is the typical process we follow. Um, again, it requires a lot of judgment. It requires a lot of subject matter expertise, right? Um, it it, it requires the investigation experience, right? Um, and as you can see that it, it can become limited because it's so difficult when it comes to identifying the variables based on the judgment, right? And this is one of the reasons that why in this space we are having a lot of false positive, right? Um, and as the industry is kind of moving towards leveraging machine learning, one of the primary intent of or a, a advantage of machine learning is that it allows you to identify some of the behaviors that as a human being, sometimes it's so difficult to, to, to you know, figure out, right? So basically you rely on a machine to, to tell that, hey, what other additional, you know, 10 or 15 criteria that help you to further narrow down, you know, the, the, the target that you're trying to, to search here. So Mark, if you can jump onto the next slide, I'll, I'll highlight some of the things that we just started. We are in a journey. Again, we haven't implemented anything yet, um, but we are in definitely doing a lot of work um, in, a, in a more of a proof of concept mode right now, I would say. Um, so I'll briefly touch on what is machine learning, right? So machine learning is a, is a component of artificial intelligence. Right, and artificial intelligence, you know, enables the machine to behave like human. Right, it's uh, it's basically mimic the human behavior, and the machine learning is a component of of AI. It use some of the statistical method to improve the overall, you know, the experience. Right, of what you know, in AML sense, where it improve the the performance of the model. What we are trying to detect here, and the machine learning has you know, three primary, you know, areas or, or methods. One is the supervised learning, and that is what, you know, I, I would recommend that to primarily rely on. The second is the unsupervised learning, and the third is the reinforcement uh, learning. Um, the supervised learning is something that, you know, it, it, it's as simple as it's taught by example, right? It's, uh, it's use the training data set, right, uh, to teach the model to get the desired output, right? So, uh, you know, you need to have your training data. So that does include all your transaction data or your inputs, right? As well as your target variable that you are trying to detect, right? So it include all your uh, case or the SAR flagging, right? That each of the alerts. Um, and, and when it comes to the unsupervised learning, I would say it's quite opposite to it. You know, you don't have the label data, right? So you don't have uh, you, you know, what you're trying to detect, you don't know the problem, right? So as we see, you know, for human trafficking, we know what problem we are trying to detect. And if you are building that supervised learning, you already have, need to have some good training data on those human trafficking cases that you can leverage, right? Versus unsupervised learning, it's basically, um, you know, help you to try to identify a pattern of behavior that you don't know, right? So, you know, if you have a problem that you don't know, you don't have a good data or trained data, right? Then it's a unsupervised learning is a is a way to go. And I'll cover some use cases that you know uh, where it can can be applicable in our space. Um, and I'll keep the reinforcement learning um, for um, today's webinar. Um, so when jump to the supervised learning, right? Um, there are two mainstream. Um, uh, one is the classification, and the second is the regression. Um, and the classification basically help you to classify the test data into two categories, right? So in our space, for example, effective alert versus non-effective alert. And I'm sure we have all are, you know, very used to using the classification supervised learning method. The one simple example I'll give you is 
um, your inbox, right? You have a spam versus non-spam, right? That that go to, that that method is just you know designed based on the the classification learning, right? And we are all used to you know using that functionality in the inbox, right? So it's nothing new. Uh, obviously, you know. Uh, it's a it's a buzzword now, and uh, you know there's a lot of discussion in our space to use it, and the regulators are also um, you know recommending now um, to kind of um, you know innovate the space in this direction. Um, so you know that's the one use cases that I see, um, and that's the journey we are taking here in our organization. The second one is the regression, which is mostly I would say think as example like a linear regression, right? You're trying to predict your sales forecasting, right? And uh, that's one of the, you know, the easiest example I can give. It basically established the relationship between your dependent and independent variable or your target variable, right? Um, and, you know, as I said, um, there are several methods, uh, but the most common uh, are the logistic regression, the decision tree, um, as well as the random forest and the gradient boost. Uh, in our shop, because we want to keep it simple, we want to focus mostly, you know, more on a explainability and a interpretability of the of the model, right? That we can easily articulate to the regulators that in what kind of cases the model is designing this behavior, right? Um, so that's why we are starting and focusing mostly on the logistic regression and the decision tree as of now. And once we get a little maturity, of course, our goal is to kind of, you know, go on the a little more advanced technique like random forest and the gradient post. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly walk through the flow. Um, so Mark, if you can jump to the next slide, um, this is the typical flow we follow in our shop. You know, the first step is obviously data collection, right? So you have to collect all your transaction data uh, and all your, you know, as well as any other additional data like your KYC data. And obviously you need alert to the case data, right? Because that's what the, the behavior you're trying to detect, right? So the first step is to have the, the, the data of course, you have to, you know, remove if there is any, you know, skewed data or data with the errors, right? We have to do initial data assessment to make sure that we don't have um, incorrect invalid data, right? And from there, the next step is the feature extraction. And I'll cover that in, in, a, in a detail in the next slide. That is, feature extraction is probably one of the most important work in building the machine learning model. If you need the model with good performance, this is the one specific area that, we need to focus most, uh, uh, and I'll cover that shortly. And once you have the feature identified, the next step is to look for what algorithm you know I, I want to select, right? And if you know what problem you have, what problem you are trying to detect, right? Um, you can easily go with the supervised learning, right? You can go with a simple like logistic, um, as well as the uh, 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 the entry model. And uh, one of the you know, aspect you need to consider while you are building the model is what kind of performance you are seeing, right? So once you start building the model, you have to keep constant eye on the model evaluation. The false negative is a big thing in our space, right? So you have to, since you have the training data, you know how many stars are being missed by the model, right? And ultimately that help you to come back to, again, the feature extraction work, right? And there are a lot of techniques that you can use to identify the most important feature, mostly from a qualitative, quantitative perspective. But this is the one area that, you know, the, the domain expertise become very important, right? Having that AML investigation knowledge, and, and that's what, you know, like uh, we have, a, as Mark mentioned at the beginning, this is not just the work of one or two people, right? You need data science expertise, you need people with the investigation expertise, and those people kind of work together to design that model. And once the model is being structured, you can see here the um, at the bottom that gets into production, right? And that basically start assigning um, the label um, to, to your you know uh, test data or unseen data. So Mark, if you go to the next slide, let me just jump on the feature, you know, engineering. What does it mean? And this is the one specific area where, you know, I, I have a hybrid team. I have people with you know data skill as well as the investigation skill. Um, and this is where, you know, those people kind of work hand in hand comes together, uh, as well as, you know, our other modeling team. Um, the, and, uh, you know, this is a tedious process, right? As I said, it's a process to create information into a form of variables, right? And this process basically allows you to identify behaviors that it's, a, it's a very difficult to identify through naked eyes, right? Um, so it, you know, you create hundreds of variables, you know, variables like 
you know, simple transaction, right? You count your cash activity per day, per week, per month. You look at your average balances. Um, you know, you look at um, the velocity in the account. You look at your ratio between your cash to wire, right? So I'm just giving some example, right? You, you, you can create hundreds of features and then ask the machine, right, uh, that what are the, my top most features, right, uh, with respect to that SAR data you're trying to, uh, or SAR label that you're trying to, to detect, right? Uh, and in most cases, you would get, you know, really good 10 to 15 or 20 variables or features, but some of those could not be easily supported from a compliance perspective, right? Um, so that's where the domain expertise come into play. Right in the AML space, space, we cannot say that client is a profitable. That's why, you know, uh, uh, and if the, if, like a profitable as a feature, right? Uh, it, it, even it shows that it has a good performance against, you know, predicting your SAR data, it, it's going to be difficult to, to justify that feature selection, right? Because it's, it's not going to go well with the regulators, right? So this is, I would say, the most important aspect. This is where um, the investigation, the data science, both skills are very essential, right? Uh, and if you do uh, a good work here, I, I think your modeling work become much easier. And this is, I would say, the one area where we spend almost 60% of the time in the model building. Um, so just just keep keep that in mind. Um, so Mark, if you go to the next slide, I'll quickly cover some of the use cases, right? So the first one that we are working in our space is the alert scoring prioritization model. Um, where we are basically the goal, this, the, the initial goal is to take any existing scenario, create a model with a method like logistic regression or the CN tree, and uh, that would basically you know, use some additional feature on top of what the current algorithm is using, the mental scenario is using, right? Um, and it would basically assign a scoring criteria uh, to those alerts, right? And the goal is to initially prioritize those alerts based on the score and run it like that in maybe a production environment for several months, right? And it basically uh, approach where you can easily explain to the regulators the, the kind of performance you are seeing it, right? So it become easier to uh, move that into production. If you are kind of auto-closing from day one, I, I think it, it, it's kind of driving to a separate discussion, right? But once you can show that the model is reasonably accurate, it is predicting accurately and giving you a good performance, then you can obviously go into a you know mode of hibernation or auto close some of the alerts with the lower score, right? And let me just tell you, no particular model will give you 100% performance. That is where also we get you know a lot of work with you know my team, Mark's team, as well as our investigators to look at it, which are the alerts or SAR, even though they are very small number, are being missed by the model, right? The machine learning model. And then we really, you know, ask the question, are those the one that we really want to detect, right? Or are we comfortable missing them? Because we know in our space, there are SARS that are really important, right? But there are SARS that, you know, might be defensive, right? So we do, you know, that work as well as part of this, you know, whole machine learning building. And at the end, you know, you, you require a lot of documentation just to make sure that, you know, how you come to that conclusion. Um, so, you know, that's the alert scoring, alert prioritization is the one use case. The second two use, the second and third are, are I would say more of unsupervised learning um, uh, uh, techniques. The population identif identification is one of the problem in our space because we don't know the peer grouping or segmentation of our customer, right? And uh, that is the most common problem because if we know what are the customers that behave similarly, it becomes much easier to identify a right threshold for them, right? And then you can easily identify what would be, you know, the outlier activity, right? But that's the biggest problem. And, you know, you can definitely leverage unsupervised machine learning technique to identify or come up with that clustering, the, you know, combining the activity that uh, of a customers that behave similarly, right? So identical behaviors, you just can, you know, group them into one cluster. And that ultimately can help you to, to identify the anomaly detection, right? As I said, once you know that, you know, these are all my gas station or these are all my dry cleaner, you can easily identify, you know, who is the dry cleaner that has a, a outlier compared to everyone else, right? So um, I'll jump to the next slide, um, just to recap what Mark and I have covered. Um, Mark, if you can go to the next slide. So as Mark walk us through the transaction monitoring coverage assessment, right? That's the one of the critical, you know, the first exercise we 
do we have done and we periodically do to make sure that we have a proper coverage for you know various typologies as well as products and services and you know the banks are growing with a lot of new products and services so you have to make sure that you have a proper monitoring coverage um, we also you know mark talk about uh, the use case uh, the human trafficking right so you need to first know the problem then you need to identify what red flags that goes with detecting that problem. And once you know those red flags, you have to narrow down to the data elements that you need uh, for detection, right? The one that you are you can get it within your bank data set, right? And once you get that, you need to do distribution analysis to kind of narrow down and focus on what you're trying to detect, right? Um, and then I also briefly talk about, you know, how can you leverage the machine learning um, to to you know improvise your your detection scenarios right and, and increase the effectiveness and the efficiency. So Priyank and Mark, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this question uh, to both of you actually uh, to see if either one of you or both of you have a a, a take on it. Uh, so you mentioned um, Priyank that team members with um, should be put together with complementing skills and trying to get them to work together. What crossover skills for each team member? would be the most helpful in building out a successful team? So what I have seen is from my experience and Mark, sorry for going ahead, right? So in a larger institution, you typically have the, the center of excellence, right? So you have all your quantitative folks group into one team, right? All your investigator group into separate team, right? So uh, what, and this is a really good question, right? Uh, what you really need to do here is to, have people within like for my team my team is a governance organization right we do the governance of the transaction monitoring scenario you need to have a skill where people understand not only the investigation aspect but also the modeling aspect aspect they don't need to be the data science folks right but they at least need to understand you know what language to communicate that a, a data modeler right or a data science person can can understand it right so you really need to have that skill set at least, and that can be achieved through training, right, or some webinars or exposure. Uh, and uh, it, it, and from a modeling side, I would say they need to have experience around the data, first of all, because the quantitative statistical understanding is a one aspect, right? But having the knowledge of the banking products and services is a different animal, right? So they need to have that understanding that what kind of transaction you can expect in a one particular product because wires are totally different than your credit card, right? And also if they have a, you know, experience at least a basic understanding of your investigation workflow, that would, you know, also ultimately help them, you know, when they are kind of doing that data engineering work. And to that point, Ma yeah, what I was going to say is uh, we kind of skipped over it, but like when we're doing this, a lot of these we put into what we call a pilot program that they aren't put into production right away we put it into a pilot program, we generate pilot alerts, and then we actually work with our investigations team to review it. They let us know if it's good or not, and it actually becomes an iterative process until we've got our criteria fine-tuned enough where we think, all right, this looks like it's getting to what we want, and then we put it into production. So it, it takes everyone's skills, and but it also, as Priyank said, it takes the ability to communicate amongst one another that takes the investigation team tell us this is what they're seeing and what they want to have it takes the data folks interpreting that putting it into place with a query that can detect it we feed it back to the investigations team does this look better they say yes or no and we keep going through that iterative process yeah and just to add quick right uh, in aml space it's a very difficult to retire a scenario from production, right? So as Mark mentioned, before you turn on, you have to make sure that the scenario you're trying to put in production is really giving you what you're trying to detect, right? And that's why we go through that iterative process to make sure that, you know, whatever typology we come up with, it is giving us, you know, what we are intended to, 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 to detect out of it. Okay, great. We have no further questions, Mark and Priyank. Um, so thank you. All right, I will stop sharing. And we'll hand it off to Bill. Excellent, thank you. And that was um, very helpful in uh, teeing me up for sure. And so let me share my screen and let me know when you can see the uh, intro screen. Am I sharing? Yes. Okay, yes. great, excellent. Thank you. It's um, 
what was so refreshing as Mark and, and Priyank were talking is that they're really talking about that's what state of the art is today in the transaction monitoring area. And as Priyank was saying, it's all about the modeling. And, but you can't, once you've done the modeling, you've got to fill that with data. And that's where we're seeing some of the opportunities being lost that not all organizations have the exact same amount of information that they can, can mine. And what, what we think about at, um, at Moody's Analytics is we understand the sophistication of what's happening to try to stop the bad guys, to try to, to, to take out the, uh, the money laundering element. Um, and, and, and it's so difficult. The, the amount of money being laundered continues to increase. And, and how we believe it is going to, we're gonna really change the tide is for all of these operational areas that are being done, like the transaction monitoring just discussed. Can we add to that a dimension of predictability on which transactions, simply by understanding who were involved in the transactions and being able to understand who were involved in the transactions, which we would look at to try to line it up against the, one of the predicate offenses that requires money to be laundered. And so that's really that, that whole notion of there's the, the transaction monitoring, but if we can put at the front end, predictive modeling of the same type that Priyank was talking about, how much further could we go? Because we would be focusing those models much better. It was that population that um, Priyank was talking about. So today, what I'm gonna do is just in the next 15, 20 minutes, um, I'll call it 18 minutes. I wanna just talk about some current events. I'm gonna go through this quickly, but I am gonna, um, I, I will send this deck to, to Bill and he can then distribute it as any, um, if you can get a hold of him so that you have some of the details. But I'm just gonna look at multiple data sets, how they can be put together, but I'm talking about data sets that are 10X, what we just discussed in terms of transaction monitoring, literally understanding the ecosystem around how these transactions, how, we, how they evolved and who actually was involved in them. And not just the customer, but the customer's relationships. And obviously we have to do this within privacy, and within legal um, terms. But the world is changing in terms of what yesterday was invisible to us is now becoming visible because of a lot of the technologies that Priyank was talking about. So moving um, right along, I'm gonna go through, um, I, if I was with you in a room, I'd say anybody heard about, um, about the Helix event and I'm hoping some of you have because it was, just a telltale of the crypto side of money laundering. And, you know, money laundering at the FinTech side went from thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars at a time to $10 at a time, because you could do a million of those and, and, and basically disguise that there was anything wrong. So you could take a million dollars and break it into $10 chunks because the technologies were so fast. Crypto, they're doing it in the hundreds of millions and it's early on. But what's, what struck me about Helix was, number one, it was in, in um, Larry Harmon is out of Akron, and, but he was, it was truly global. But if, who brought him down? Look at all of the organizations, the IRS, the FBI, all these field offices, the Office of International Affairs for the FBI, State Department, and lo and behold, the Belize Attorney General and National Police, it took all of those to bring this guy down. And sure, it was $300 million, but three to 5% is the, uh, of global GDP is the current estimate of what gets or needs to be laundered each year. Um, that's two and a half to $4 trillion. And this is 300 million. So it's happening in these types of scales, which just has enhanced what we have to, to be able to react to and think about the data that was consumed by all of those um, law enforcement organizations um, and legal organizations. It just would have been massive in terms of how much they had to consume in order to bring Larry down. And you can look this up, the DOJ just last week um, literally issued the press release. 
so you can see about it. But the other piece, to, uh, if you look at data, is what the organizations um, clearly in this in um, at, at Case Western, the the uh, FATF and the Egmont group of of financial um, investigation units, you would be seeing all of these. Um, indicators of risk, many of what Priyank was talking about in terms of what the models are built on for transaction modeling. So they just came out in March with this list of 35 indicators and you say, well, 35 indicators, that's all not, that, that's not that big. Well, they covered such diverse areas as the structural risk, which was the complexity of corporate structures of companies and then the people who run and run those companies. It was trade activity. Now you're down to the manifest level of trade, trade documents and commodities. I mean, you know, it says there's bananas in this box. Turns out there's Uzis. And it's just, and there's, it's so difficult with the volumes to find that out. And then there's the transactional, transaction, the financial transaction monitoring, which, um, <clears throat> excuse me, which Mark and, and Priyank were just talking about. So, massive amounts of data compared to where we were before but it's coming to the to it is becoming a piece of due diligence across the board for financial crime um, detection and prevention that you have to have literally multiple times the information that you've had before and that's going to take technology and that's going to take data but let me quickly go through some of the available data sets. And then I have one um, use case I really want to go through, a, a case study. But there's the typical. So we've got the commercial data sets. You can buy those from Moody's or, or multiple organizations. And then you've got the organization's data sets. And there's a huge difference between an organization's data sets that are nicely formatted, nicely structured, accurate, and ones that are just Willy nilly, and you have no, you can't make sense of it. Um, all kinds of errors. So there's, there's, there, there's such, there's such housekeeping that has to be done at every organization in order to really address these issues. And then there's more of the national registries, the LEI, the, the registries. But registries, you know, the UK put it into effect years ago, and they're just getting some. Um, they're just getting some returns on it where they have an ownership registry. FinCEN is supposed to build one for the US in the next while, and it's not even gonna be open source. Right now you have to get a subpoena to get it is what the projection is, but they're two to three, four years from having that. But what was the one learning out of the UK? The bad guys weren't disclosing, lo and behold. That's, what they, that's why we can't assume. That's a great telltale of information, but that's one piece of information. I'd say the biggest breakthrough, and I'll get to it in the case study, was the anonymized data sets that allow cross-organization sharing. That has come a long way. Now, multiple data sets, what's the research focus today? It's been on, in this space, it's been on the, the um, crime traits and detection, so that while you're looking at transactions, you've applied a pre-learning and a, and a predictive modeling so that there's more information about those transactions as they're coming through the process that Mark and Priyank were talking about. And that means that we understand relationships in a way we never have. Companies to people, people to people, companies to companies, all of those are in play if you're trying to really get at some of the, the, um, the criminal elements. So that, and that is not going to, uh, to diminish anytime soon. Hey, Bill, uh, quick question that's very sure. relevant. I want to hop in here real quick on this. So Please. it's an interesting question. It seems that AML professionals have a growing advantage over the money launders and that AML professionals have large amounts of data to use in finding the quote unquote tells, so to speak, of money laundering activity. Do you believe this will eventually grow to AML professionals being less reactive and more proactive in stopping money laundering? Absolutely, that's the entire game. You have to be proactive because if we react, if we're looking at transactions and for our, to, to, to take these guys down, if we're writing SARS and we're counting on the FBI or any um, national uh, um, police to do something about them, those SARS are gonna have to be 
absolutely crisp and full of details. And so I, I think it's a the it's definitely moving towards a predictive model. And that is starting with relationships. And again, privacy is a real big issue and legality, the information is a big issue, but there's so much more information that we're starting to be able to detect. As I call it here, you detect criminal traits from transparent signals. Well, transparent signals five years ago is was 20% of what transparent signals are today and will be a fraction of what transparent signals are two, three years from today. And by transparent, I mean, we have figured it out because smart technology looked at 10 times, 100 times the data that it was looking at before and painted pictures that we've never seen. And that's what we're seeing um, at Moody's just in terms of our um, just diving down into the predictive modeling side of this before we get to the transaction. So absolutely, but do not kid yourself. The data science teams and the um, MBAs that the cartels and the criminal networks have are every bit as good and they are most times better funded. So we're going to have to model beyond the way before the transactions to exactly that front end, because that's just the reality of this situation is you have got to have much more information transparently digested and consumable because of your technologies and, the te and what, um, <clears throat> what was being talked about as far as the transaction monitoring. So when Priyank was talking about data, we need much more. Great. But just, to you, get, just to get through this um, a little bit more, um, just in terms of this whole notion of privacy enhanced information, financial conduct authority, and, and you may have been looking at this in, in the law school and in classes, but I know some of the practitioners ACAMs have been for sure. They did a lot of tech sprints two, three, four years ago in this whole area, and it was amazing what came out of it so that you take anonymized information and if there's enough of it and you have multiple anonymized um, data sets with structured data sets and unstructured data sets, all with information that is relatable, it's amazing the pictures that are being painted by those models that Priyank was talking about. So this whole notion of privacy enhanced, if you wanna you know a, a, a truly state-of-the-art um, look up fincom.co. It's a, this is a world, this is where the world's going, where you can take multiple languages. They've got 20, 22 languages. They've identified the similar phonetics across all languages, and they've put it into a numeric so that my name in Cyrillic has the same numeric as it does in English. Massively powerful uh, deployed against a how do you find the connection between people? And it's things like that where, you know, the decoder ring will have who those individuals are, but it's gonna be numerics. And numerics, as far as if a name is a numeric across all languages, all of a sudden there's ultimate privacy in that because it's a numeric. And a numeric is a heck of a lot easier to match. So my Cyrillic and my, so little things like that. This is not completely um, all the way there, but it is definitely the, the way the world is, is, is moving along. So let me talk about transcrime. That's about all I will get to today. But so this is all about criminal network detections. Um, some of you I'm hoping have had some, um, some exper exposure to transcrime. I'm just gonna go through it in, it in the details that it looks for and what data sets it uses. But it's a joint research center um, based in Italy, academics, the EU, and then law, force, law enforcement across the EU. It then has partners around the world for data sets. So they're a partner of, of Moody's and they consume a bunch of Moody's structured information as part of the other information they're getting. But they're getting law, they are getting anonymized law enforcement feeds. They are getting um, definitely unstructured feeds and I'll go through them. And what they're doing is they're amassing 10, 15, 20 times the information they would normally have looked at just five, seven years ago to be able to detect relationships that can detect, can point investigators 
at a small subset of companies and people that could be the telltales for a criminal network. And it was started in Italy for obvious reasons because that's where they were um, focusing on the mafia. But now that they've been around for a long time and they're actually now have a private um, piece of this where they can have tools that individuals, that, that companies and people can, can use. But generally they're focused on money laundering, financial crime, um, organized crime. They're looking at the arrangements and the legal persons and, comp and legal entities. And then they're looking at corruption and collusion because what we found is the old days, well, yesterday, it was all about ownership and that and all most of the regulations are about majority ownership. And if you deal with somebody with majority ownership who's sanctioned, you have a sanctioned exposure. Well, now it's the, the bad guy has 1%, half a percent, and they have basically they've established coalitions with other shareholders who are anonymous to any risk. And um, so they, they look completely independent until you get below the surface, many times with things like social media and unstructured information that has still not been deemed private because you can't, people turn on their social and all of a sudden there's all kinds of information. And until it's restricted and made um, private, it's gonna get consumed by these, by these systems. So it's a, it's a major thing. But what they've been able to do with this is take the public and private information, as I talked about, police and judicial sources, most of it anonymized. They're structured sources like um, sanctions lists, company data. So they use a lot of that from Moody's. And that's everything that the owners, the, the IDs, where they are, um, all of the firmographics around it, hundreds of pieces of information around every single company and every single company's overlay of people and other companies all of a sudden relationships are getting able to be mined and predicted in terms of, of um, criminal activity that has been hooked to any one of them. And then definitely the proprietary, proprietary data and databases is a big piece for, for fin crime now. And then compliance information, the standard sanctions, political exposures, adverse media, but in much greater detail. And then finally, the unstructured information. So massive amounts of, of data that's coming in that with the models that were being talked about and, and Priyank were talking about the, the use of those, they can mine these, they can consume these and they can move those models to the front end so that the back end models can be doing much more focused work because we've got some telltales at the front end. Um, I'm gonna end at that point because I know I don't want to go over, we've only got a couple of minutes, but um, you already heard from Priyank about the approaches supervised, unsupervised. The last thought, and I'm not gonna be able to get into the um, aligning the rest, but I'll send these, this deck to Bill. It's this point right here. What I see is technology, everything that Priyank was talking about, everything that's state of the art today is getting commodity. What's not commodity is the data and the human reasoning that was used, um, and that's human reasoning across some ecosystem like financial crime detection that goes to training the models. Machine learning is useless if you don't have the right learning from the humans. And a knowledge graph that is created is useless if we can't put the right data into it. And, and it needs to consume massive amounts of data. So I would emphasize to the scholastic, I would emphasize to the practitioners, the technology is becoming commodity. What's not good commodity right now is the data and human reasoning that's going into teaching the knowledge graphs through machine learning and natural language processing. That is to me the biggest um, shortfall now. And I'm sure hoping I'm wrong in five, seven years as um, more of what CASE is working on in terms of their programs uh, comes to fruition. So I will stop because I know we're at time, but um, if there are any quick questions. Actually, Bill, if you could um, stop sharing your screen so I can share the activity code while um, we look and see if there are any other questions while Jim looks.